It's hard to believe, but Skyrim is almost 10 years old. That's a long time in the video game world, but somehow it doesn't feel like it's been that long since Skyrim first swept the globe with its epic landscape, grandiose heights, and unparalleled freedom. Although, the reason it probably doesn't feel that old is because Bethesda have been persistently milking their cash cow for all it's worth with various DLC expansions, re-releases, special editions, new versions, and new ports. Then you factor in a dedicated modding community that has continually breathed new life into the game with fun and exciting twists and all new adventures, and it becomes clear that Skyrim has never really left the limelight in all the time it's been out. Skyrim's tenacious prevalence within the gaming industry is almost a fact of life at this point, hence the popular memes about it being ported to every inconceivable piece of tech possible. I played Skyrim a couple months after it first came out, back in January 2012, and while I enjoyed the game enough to sink 130 hours into it at the time, I ultimately came away feeling like it wasn't time well spent as I became increasingly disillusioned by its deceptive lack of depth and its repetitive gameplay experience. In retrospect, the only reason I sank that much time into it at all was because of mods, which not only helped to fix some of the game's rougher edges, but also gave me all new things to do in the game. I have to give Bethesda credit for releasing such an extensive toolkit and thus allowing for such a great modding community, but I can't give them credit for the mods themselves, however, seeing as those mods are all entirely fan-made, and many of them were made out of pure necessity to fill in, flesh out, or correct oversights and shortcomings in Bethesda's original design. In replaying Skyrim in 2020, I wanted to base my review on as much of the plain, vanilla version with all of the latest official patches as possible, because that's really the only fair baseline by which to judge the game. Skyrim's modding scene is great and can do genuine wonders for the game, yes, but modding potential is not universally applicable across all platforms, seeing as console players never had access to mods until the Xbox One and PS4 Special Editions came out several years later, and current Nintendo Switch players may never see official modding support ever. Besides that, it's just impossible to create a basis of comparison since modded versions of the game can be such wildly different experiences based on whatever unique combination of mods that particular person installs, so conclusions I might draw from my modded game would not be applicable to someone else's game. And ultimately, Bethesda is the one who got my $50 back in the day, and since they're benefiting from the volunteer work of their community, it's their efforts I want to focus on. In other words, I'm going to judge the game Bethesda created, not the game the fans created. Before getting to the actual review, I need to point out that this is a pretty big game with a lot of diverse elements that can vary greatly in quality, so I'm going to be talking in a lot of general terms using specific examples to illustrate my point. Those examples aren't necessarily representative of the entire game as a whole, as there will always be exceptions to every claim, but as the saying goes, the exception is not the rule. These conclusions and takeaways are all based on how the game played out in my experience, but the experience can vary greatly depending on one's background as a gamer and how one chooses to play it, and so your experience might vary. As you might guess from the title, I'm going to be fairly critical of Skyrim, but I'm not trying to say anyone is wrong for liking Skyrim or that my experience is the only correct one. Finally, this review will be based on playing just the base, vanilla version of the game updated to the latest version with only a handful of mods installed which include Sky UI, Follower Commentary Overhaul, Amazing Follower Tweaks, Correct Race Height, and Mule Facelift. One of Skyrim's biggest selling points, literally, is the sheer size of its world. At the time, it was unrivaled in scale. No other games of that time with that production value had such massive worlds with so much to see and do within them. The map is literally miles wide with mountainous heights you can actually climb. If you count walking up man-made hiking paths or gliding across collision meshes on your horse as climbing. And it's here where I take one of my first and biggest issues with Skyrim. For a world of this size, it's kind of a waste because there's so much dead space and repetitive content. The main issue I find is that the overworld itself feels kind of pointless except to spread out the various map markers. When you set out exploring in Skyrim, you're unlikely to find much in the way of interesting content except by following map markers on the compass, because there's hardly anything to see or do in the world between those special locations except collecting plants and fighting wild animals. 
In the rare instance when you do stumble into an unmarked location or have some kind of random encounter, they tend to be pretty inconsequential. Usually, you're just finding worthless, scaled loot that's been randomized inside a treasure chest, or it's an incredibly short interaction with an NPC that never builds into something more substantial. Most of the time, however, you're just wandering around huge, wide-open expanses completely devoid of any interesting structure or content, with the only worthwhile thing to pique your curiosity being someplace way off on the horizon. At which point, gameplay consists entirely of hold down the W key for 30 seconds until you get there, almost like you're waiting at a loading screen before you can actually start playing the game. You could possibly argue that the world design feels more realistic that way, and possibly more immersive, since a real wilderness isn't going to have interactive things to do behind every tree or under every rock, but realism doesn't necessarily translate to fun game design. It's inherently unrealistic, after all, that your character can get struck with multiple arrows and suffer zero consequences from it, and then be back at full health in an instant by chugging a few healing potions. But we accept that kind of thing as video games bending the laws of reality to facilitate better gameplay. Because it's not fun to have an arrow pierce your skull and cause a game over instantly, or to have an arrow pierce your stomach and force you to lie in a hospital bed for weeks recovering from internal bleeding. Having the map in Skyrim be so spread out, with long and wide stretches of basically nothing separating unique points of interest may be more realistic, but that comes at the expense of pacing by slowing the game down with tons of moments where nothing really happens and where there's nothing for you to actively do in the game. Maybe you're someone who enjoys nature treks and the calm moments associated with simply wandering the world and taking in the sights, but to me it feels like the game is deliberately wasting my time, and I find exploration boring and unsatisfying when so much of it revolves around passively following icons on the compass instead of actually exploring and discovering things for myself. The obvious suggestion for that issue might be to simply turn off the compass so that I can explore the world entirely on my own, but it turns out you can't even do that in the vanilla game, as there is simply no option to disable the compass. The closest you can do is set the HUD capacity to zero, which removes everything, including your health, stamina, and magicka, and is therefore not an ideal solution. Even if you could disable just the compass, I would be dubious of doing so, because the entire world and all of its quests seem designed around the compass. With the world being so big and with the majority of its landmass only existing to spread out the actual areas of meaningful content, I would worry about the game turning into a wild goose chase fruitlessly seeking out content, or being utterly hopeless to discover places you're intended to go due to the lack of directions given to you by characters or the journal system. As much as I might dislike the concept of the compass for how much it turns the game into a passive matter of follow the icon, it's almost a necessity in a game like this. I don't think you can just remove the compass and magically solve the issue without also redesigning the world and all of its content to better facilitate self-driven exploration. Basically, you either keep the compass or you make the world smaller and a lot more structured, with more concrete direction given to the player. And the compass really is problematic for me, because I find it greatly devalues exploration when it's leading you to everything before you actually have a chance to discover things on your own. Oftentimes, the only reason you even know there's something worth checking out in a certain direction is because an icon is marked on the compass, which encourages you to just mindlessly follow the compass instead of actually engaging with the world with your own eyes. Finding a cool hidden area isn't a reward for keen observation or methodical determination or shrewd thought processing, but is merely the result of going exactly where the game specifically tells you to go. Granted, you might not know exactly what you'll find when you get there. For all you know, it could be some crazy off-the-wall quest that sends you into another dimension for an utterly unique scenario, which can be exciting and surprising when you actually get there, so exploration isn't completely devoid of fun satisfaction, but it feels shallow and straightforward with how easily the game devolves into just following icons on the compass. The other thing that feels like a waste with this world design is that you spend a lot of time, perhaps up to half of your total playtime, in smaller, linear dungeons that are completely separate and removed from the overworld design. Regular viewers of my channel should know by now that I'm a big fan of dungeons and open world video games, because I like having that contrast of a more linear, directed, and goal-oriented gameplay experience juxtaposed against the open freedom of the overworld, since it adds variety to the experience and provides a meaningful contrast to better appreciate the open world. My problem with Skyrim is that it just goes overboard with the dungeons and puts too much of the game's content inside those claustrophobic spaces. 
When exploring the overworld, a majority of the marked locations you'll discover are caves, fortresses, and ruins that take you out of the overworld, and the majority of quests you pick up send you into those various dungeons. It doesn't really matter where you go in the world or what quest you're doing, as it seems like you'll inevitably wind up inside yet another dungeon with practically the exact same gameplay formula. Follow a linear series of rooms fighting bandits or draugr, maybe occasionally stopping to do a simple picture matching puzzle or to loot a chest in a side room on your way to the boss chamber at the end, where you'll find a big chest with a main reward and a shortcut leading back to the entrance. Unlike Morrowind and Oblivion, Skyrim's dungeons are all technically unique since they don't rely on the same cookie-cutter assembly of the same basic layouts, but they still reuse a lot of the same models and textures for things, so they end up looking and feeling incredibly similar to one another, especially when you factor in their virtually identical formulae. Few of the dungeons have any sort of uniquely memorable set piece or gameplay functionality, and so they all start to blur together and become repetitive very quickly. It seems pretty clear to me that the amount of dungeons in this game were churned out purely to serve as filler content, because they needed something to fill out the space and to give the player more things to do, not because there was an interesting quest, story, enemy encounter, or level design they wanted to show off. After a while, I just started ignoring these dungeons whenever I discovered a new one, because I could feel confident that the gameplay experience would be pretty similar to what I'd already seen and done countless times before, and that I was unlikely to find any kind of unique loot that would be better than what I'd already unlocked or was already using. As I said before, normally I find the prospect of dungeon crawling appealing in open world games because of how it mixes up the gameplay and provides a refreshing change of pace from the open world gameplay formula. But the dungeons didn't have that effect in this game, probably because there are just so many and because they're all so similar. Instead, it felt like just the same thing over and over again, and eventually started to feel like the main focus. Like it was a dungeon crawling game with an overworld pasted on, as opposed to an open world game with dungeons inserted into the overworld. Your experience may vary, but I had a lot of sessions early on where I'd play for a couple hours and feel like I spent the majority of my time crawling through dungeons because that's where the quests were sending me, or because those are the locations I was finding while exploring the overworld. And unfortunately, even though you're free to ignore the dungeon crawling if you don't like it or find it too repetitive, that's a pretty significant chunk of the game's explorable space and content to remove from the equation, and doesn't speak very well of the game overall if one of its main features is something you would want to ignore in the first place. The whole world design just seems like a typical case of quantity over quality, where they focused on creating as many things as possible simply to make the world bigger instead of putting their effort into making those things as unique and memorable as possible. As the sayings go, bigger isn't always better, and too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. There's something to be said about a world this big creating a more epic scale for the plot and gameplay, but it almost defeats the purpose to advertise such a huge open world and then have such a large portion of the game's content take place in claustrophobic linear dungeon corridors, or to make half of the overworld consist of functionally useless spaces that you basically just skip past and ignore and route to the next marked telegraphed location on the compass. There's a lot to see and do in this game, yes, but a lot of it feels like pointless, tedious filler content created to pad out the total playtime and artificially inflate the size of the world. Skyrim hails from a series of role-playing games, but Skyrim itself isn't really a role-playing game, as it's essentially ditched the RPG foundation in favor of being more of an open-world action-adventure game with RPG elements. That makes its RPG mechanics difficult for me to review, because it's obviously not putting as much of an emphasis on role-playing options as previous games in the series or other similar competitors. It's not trying to be a deeply mechanical, systems-based role-playing game, in other words, so it's not fair to judge it by those criteria. But at the same time, it has that established history and it still has the vague suggestion of being some semblance of an RPG. After all, RPG is its second most popular user tag on Steam, so by some definition it is an RPG and therefore must be reviewed as such. And that's the crux of the issue, really. It's not much of an RPG, but it's being marketed as one, which can lead to a lot of disappointment if you go into it with false expectations, or by valuing RPG mechanics more than Bethesda apparently did with Skyrim. 
The big issue with Skyrim's role-playing elements is that they're limited mostly to superficial aspects that people associate with RPGs without capturing any of the stronger underlying philosophies or intentions of actual RPGs. For instance, it has a leveling system where your character gets stronger throughout your adventures, it has an inventory system with merchants where you can buy and sell goods to increase the strength of your equipment, it has quests where you complete tasks for NPCs and interact with them through a dialogue interface, and most importantly, it has a character creation system where you get to make your own avatar and choose how you'll play that character. These are all staple elements of RPGs, but those things by themselves do not make a game an RPG, as Skyrim is most critically missing any sort of reactive element to how the game responds to your actual role-playing decisions through its quests and character interactions. In other words, you're given extremely limited options for how you roleplay your character, and the game won't allow you very many ways to effect your character's role into the actual gameplay unless it pertains to combat. Character creation has been streamlined to such a degree that you only determine your character's physical appearance and skip any statistical or narrative decisions governing that character's mechanical functioning. Although you might set your character up to be a burly orc warrior who is raised by wolves and therefore has limited social skills and tends to think in the most primitive of ways, you can't mechanically designate those traits to your character by assigning special priority to physical attributes like strength, or by tagging melee combat skills as major skills, or by selecting a certain birth sign or background. Then, when you start playing the game, you won't have any opportunity to respond in dialogue or to complete quests in ways that reflect your character's intended background, specialty, or personality, because every character has the same limited selection of generic dialogue options and practically every quest is resolved in the one, singular way it was scripted. Compare this to games like Fallout or Vampire Bloodlines, where your character's race and intelligence will actually change dialogue on the way NPCs react to you. I've also got several implants available to enhance your physical attributes. Uh, no. Implants, not plants. They're little machines I can put inside you to make you faster, quicker, or smarter. I recommend the smarter implant. I'm sorry, sir, but you're going to have to wait outside like everyone else. No exceptions. Uh, are you sure you're in the right place? Psychiatrics are on the third floor. Those games make you feel like the character you created because the game actually changes in a meaningful way based on how you set up your character, and further, how you choose to portray that character. A game like Planescape Torment goes even further with its dialogue choices by allowing you to signify underlying intentions. You can select the exact same line of dialogue, but your character will mean it differently depending on which way you choose to actually say it. Then we come back to Skyrim, where every character talks and acts the exact same, with the game barely reacting to your character decisions in any meaningful way, as it's mostly superficial comments here and there, because role selection and role playing don't really matter. There's a moment in the main quest, for instance, when you're sent to find someone in Riften, and you're specifically told to talk to Brynjolf for information. Seems innocent enough, except you're basically forced to complete the initiation quest to join the Thieves' Guild if you actually want to get the information from him, unless you have relatively high speechcraft to persuade him otherwise. So if you're roleplaying as a lawful good character, or else have moral qualms with committing larceny and framing someone else for it, then you either become a criminal or ignore the quest pathing and go off looking for the guy all on your own. A situation like this, especially as part of the main quest, really should have had alternative options to allow different playstyles and roleplaying archetypes to access that information from him, rather than forcing players into a particular roleplaying decision. You really should be able to bribe him for the information, or challenge him to a brawl and beat it out of him, or pickpocket a note off of him, or use a calm or fear spell on him to get him talking. As it is, your choices are either persuade him, which might not be possible if you haven't been training speechcraft, commit a crime and essentially join the Thieves' Guild, or walk away. That's barely any options at all, and only one is based on your character's actual stats and skills. As a side note, you can talk to the local barkeeper for the desired information, but this is completely unmarked and you would be forgiven for not realizing that this was a possibility, considering how heavily the game revolves around following the quest arrows. Guild quests are even worse. 
After doing a few quests for the companions, you learn that an inner circle of them are actually werewolves, and they recruit you to become one of them as well, as part of that guild's main questline. So say you like the companions, but have reasonable objections to the lifestyle involved with being a werewolf, and aren't on board with pledging your eternal soul to the god of the hunt, Hercene. Well, that's too bad, because you either become a werewolf or just stop doing that questline, leaving Ayala and Skior to spend the rest of their days on this earth standing around idly in the Underforge awaiting your confirmation. That's not a satisfying role-playing decision, because it doesn't lead to an actual outcome. You're just putting the quest on pause, essentially, and there's no other way around it. The Thieves' Guild does something similar, where you're eventually recruited to become a Nightingale, a guardian servant of the Twilight Sepulchre in both life and death where you pledge your eternal soul to Nocturnal. And you aren't even given the choice to say no or let me think about it. You basically have to say yes, and then if you really don't want to, you just awkwardly leave them in the middle of preparing for the ritual. Or alternatively, the game glitches out and breaks the entire questline by having a key NPC walk away from the ritual instead of moving to the next trigger point to allow the quest to actually advance. This is enough to make your head I think we should trust the lass and take the deal. We'll speak when the earth is complete. The rest of the guilds are equally nonsensical with how little they take your actual character and role-playing decisions into consideration. Despite being obviously tailored to appeal to certain builds and playstyles, the various guilds don't expect you to be the specific role they're trying to cater towards, because many of their quests are just generic dungeon crawls with a slightly unique story premise surrounding it. The Thieves' Guild doesn't have you doing much actual thievery, as they're basically just a mafia extorting people for money, and the College of Winterhold only expects you to cast a few basic novice-level spells before promoting you to the head of the college, all because you fetched a few important items for them and defeated some sketchy people. The idea, I guess, is for the game to be completely open and accessible to all builds and playstyles, but that makes roleplaying feel less consequential if it doesn't really matter how you've built your character. If any character can do any and all of these quests, then there's no specific payoff for choosing to play one way over another. You are, of course, free to only pick quests and guilds that somewhat match your chosen playstyle, but this is, again, more of an external influence rather than something built into the gameplay mechanics. It's a role-playing decision you impose on the game almost entirely because of its lack of reactive or adaptive mechanics, as opposed to the game actually responding to and acknowledging your specific role-playing decisions. Of course, there's nothing stopping you from using your imagination and envisioning your character to be whatever type of character you want, but any role-playing as such is happening entirely in your own head as opposed to in the actual game, which to me feels more like writing fan fiction about your character as opposed to actual role-playing. Like I said previously, the only time it feels like your build actually impacts the gameplay in a meaningful way is when it comes to combat and dungeon crawling and that's because the majority of skills relate exclusively to combat. Will you choose to kill enemies with a two-handed weapon or a one-handed weapon? Will you shoot enemies with a bow or cast fireballs at them? Will you use stealth tactics or go on blasting enemies with dragon shouts? Since you'll be spending the majority of your time fighting enemies and crawling through dungeons, these are actually pretty significant decisions that will greatly affect how your particular playthrough will feel in practice. Apart from that, though, the rest of the role-playing elements feel pretty lackluster. Except for when I was smashing enemies with a warhammer, my orc warrior never really felt like an orc warrior to me, and it felt pretty much the same as my Nord Ranger from 2012 because of the general lack of dialogue choices and straightforward quests with predominantly only one single path to completion. As you would expect for an open world game of this scale, Skyrim has countless side quests, and I mean that literally because the amount of side quests in this game is actually infinite. One of Skyrim's biggest innovations in the genre is its Radiant Quest system, which allows an algorithm to generate infinite quests by assigning different objectives to different locations. The major benefit to this system is that it tries its best to assign quests to locations you haven't explored yet, such that the core gameplay loop keeps pushing you to explore new territory, rather than forcing you to retread the same familiar paths over and over again by sending you into dungeons you've already cleared. 
That's an admirable goal, even if it's not always successful, but it has the unfortunate side effect of stripping any sort of narrative context or meaning from these side quests when everything is designed to be completely interchangeable. As a result of the game not knowing where a particular quest will be assigned or even what the objective might actually entail, you end up with generic, nondescript situations from NPCs like, a citizen has asked for our help, seems a predator has invaded their home, go clear the beast out, or, here, a guard dropped off this bounty notice. This immediately sets the quest up as shallow busy work when it has absolutely zero exposition and gives you an utterly bland, simple, and straightforward objective. But then you do it anyway, and later get the exact same generic, nondescript pitch from the quest giver for essentially the exact same quest, but with a new enemy to kill in a new location. Clearly, the specific context of the quest doesn't matter and there's no story or character element to it whatsoever, because you really can't inject any of that into a soulless quest that's been generated from random variables by a computer algorithm. That, in turn, makes pretty much all of these Radiant quests tediously shallow and repetitive to the point that they're not even worth doing. Even other, more developed side quests that would seem to have a little more story and character to them fall victim to the algorithm's random assigning of variables. A quest in the College of Winterhold, like Anmin's Request, for instance, seems to have you resolving a quarreling dispute between two students over a family heirloom that Anmun regrets trading to Enthir. But in order to get Enthir to return the amulet to Anmund, you have to do essentially the same thing for him. Get a staff back for him that he regrets giving away. Fair enough, I guess, but because of the random variables inherent in the Radiant quest design, you get more generic, nondescript dialogue where Enthir basically just says, Get me my staff and I'll give you Anmund's amulet, and nothing else. And you're left standing there wondering, where is it? Where should I start looking? Who did you even give it to? What should I expect up ahead? Any and all context surrounding the actual objective itself is stripped from the dialogue, forcing you to bring up the quest arrow to figure out where to actually go to resolve the quest, and thereby creating a mechanical disconnect from the narrative presentation. The only reason you know how to resolve the quest is because a background game mechanic tells you, as opposed to the actual quest design or something more immersive like the character himself. It doesn't help that a lot of these side quests are deemed so inconsequential by the game itself that they get lumped into a generic miscellaneous tab in your quest journal, where any and all details that might help you remember what the quest is actually about, or who it's even for, gets removed in favor of simply listing the objective by itself, like it's some kind of tedious chore on a checklist to accomplish. What, for instance, am I supposed to get out of Find 20 Jazz Bay? It's been dozens of hours since I picked up that quest, and I've long forgotten who gave me that quest or why they even need the Jazz Bay in the first place. Why would I want to get a Mark of Debella for these various people? What did I do that I now need to return to Talanger and Shadir for? Who even are these people and how would I find them if not for the quest arrow? Maybe it's my fault for forgetting these kinds of details, but it seems like that information should really be present in the quest journal so that you can actually contextualize what you're doing in this huge open world game that strongly encourages you to go off doing all kinds of different things in sporadic orders. It's really, really easy to pick up a quest, oftentimes unintentionally, that you have to put off because you're already focused on other things and then forget about it after a while, which then makes returning to the quest journal an act of futility except to turn on the quest tracking so that you can figure out where to actually go and what to do. Consequently, a lot of the game's quest design boils down to mindlessly following the quest arrow because you're given little to no opportunity to figure things out for yourself. The game tells you what needs to be done, and then you go do it. An early quest for the Thieves' Guild, for instance, has you extorting money out of local business owners and sending a message that the guild is not to be trifled with. Initially, you're given an open-ended prompt to figure it out, and if you do it right, you'll be granted permanent membership to the guild. But then you ask for more details, and Brynjolf straight up tells you the solution to get each of them to pay up. So instead of the fun satisfaction of exploring different possibilities and trying to pick the best one, you simply do as you're told and follow the intended path through the quest. Another quest has you doing the bidding of Mara, the goddess of love, by acting as a matchmaker of sorts. In one stage of the quest, you're helping unite the mage Calselmo with the house Carl Falin, and you accomplish this by simply running around talking to people and exhausting all of the dialogue options. The quest arrow tells you exactly where to go at all times, and your dialogue choices don't matter because you only ever get two options at a time, and they only create minor deviations in the dialogue tree that last for but a single line of reaction before reconverging back on the main path of progression. 
I really must stress that you do nothing of your own accord as a player to help bring these two characters together, because the quest practically solves itself and all you really do is push buttons to make it move forward on its set trajectory. A lot of the bigger quests also suffer from weird pacing issues that ultimately detract from the overall experience. The main quest establishes that dragons have returned to Skyrim and that you're some sort of legendary dragonborn, the first in hundreds of years, who must stop the dragons from plunging the world into eternal ruin. But really, dragons don't actually invade at any point until you advance the main quest several more stages, so if you go wandering off to do your own thing and ignore the main quest, as is often done in these types of games, then the main threat never actually appears. In a way, the world is actually safer if the chosen hero never lifts a finger to do anything about it, so there's no real impetus to get the main story rolling on your supposedly epic journey to save the world. Once you do get it rolling, you're given a grandiose premise of learning to harness your dragonborn powers so that you can defeat Alduin, an all-powerful prophecy dragon known as the World Eater who was once destined to end the world ages ago but was thwarted by another dragonborn. But then, after a few preliminary quests to establish what's actually going on in the world, the rest of the main questline seems to awkwardly rush through the story by having you mostly perform a bunch of relatively simple and mundane tasks. Most of what you're doing throughout the second and third acts consists of just talking to people and fetching artifacts from dungeons, with only a few standout moments along the way like visiting Alduin's Wall or descending into Blackreach in search of an Elder Scroll, before reaching the climax where you capture a dragon and then ascend into Sovngarde, the Nordic afterlife, to fight Alduin, who turns out to be just another ordinary dragon encounter, the likes of which you've already fought dozens of times previously. The whole thing can be completed in about a day of extended gaming if you were to focus solely on the main quest, with each act lasting only a few hours, which makes the rapid ascent to fighting Alduin and Sovngarde almost anticlimactic. The guild quests are pretty lackluster in this regard too, since they all have you rising from a new recruit to Grand Master within the span of a few days of in-game time. The fact that you're somehow also conveniently the chosen one for each and every faction is pretty farcical too when you stop to think about it. It almost makes the quest design feel pandering, like it's all trying a little too hard to make you feel special without you doing much to actually earn that feeling. Then we've got the Civil War quests, which don't feel like a war at all, as they're just small skirmishes over a handful of individual forts. You can find Stormcloak and Imperial camps in close proximity to one another, but they never actually fight on their own unless you're there for part of a Civil War quest, and then the fight only lasts a few minutes. In fact, you can fight the whole war in just a couple hours by claiming a few forts and killing a few dozen of the opposing faction. The battle for Whiterun at least has some semblance of epic stakes and conflict, with the city being lit ablaze in dramatic fashion, but the battle has no practical effect on the city once all is said and done. Any changes are purely cosmetic, like a trellis being knocked over or the guards now wearing a different color armor. If you go around talking to actual citizenry, they'll even tell you so much, that the new regime is really no different than the previous one and that they really don't care what's going on. Imperials, Stormcloaks, I don't care who's in charge around here, I just want to make money. This factors into the role-playing as well as yet another example of the game not responding to role-playing decisions in a meaningful way. Picking a side in the Civil War really should be a big and impactful decision, but at least in the case of its effect on Whiterun, the decision is pretty inconsequential. Skyrim features a leveling system similar to what's been established in previous Elder Scrolls games, except this time it takes a more streamlined and open-ended approach. Instead of crafting a specific character build from character creation, you start the game as a blank slate and mold your build directly through gameplay, always able to freely change things up at any time by selecting a new star sign or by assigning perk points into different fields. I typically like this type of approach because it gives you more flexibility to figure out how you actually want to play the game rather than forcing you to make uninformed decisions before you start playing and then locking you in with those ignorant choices. Plus, it gives you a little more active strategic decision making by deciding how to allocate perk points for what specific bonuses you want instead of the game automatically unlocking set perks every 25 skill levels like in the previous games. So I like this system in theory, but in practice I find it somewhat shallow and dull. The main problem I find with the perk system is that the majority of perks are just background modifiers that improve what you're already doing by an arbitrary percentage. 
Novice level spells cost 50% magic, add up locks are 50% easier, two-handed weapons do 20% extra damage, power attacks have a 20% chance to stagger enemies, buy and sell prices are 10% better, and so on. None of these alter your gameplay in any meaningful way, and in fact, few perks actually do, as pretty much everything is just a passive stat boost. As a melee fighter, my gameplay remained virtually identical from the beginning of the game until the end, except I unlocked a couple special power attacks, one of which I never used because it seemed outclassed by the other options. To be clear, these perks do have a serious effect on your character's strength and progression. Like, for instance, Warhammer's ignoring up to 75% of the target's armor is a pretty big deal. But it's hard to feel it as an actual player because it all happens so gradually and almost exclusively through behind-the-scenes math. And that's really unfortunate, because one of the most satisfying aspects of RPGs, to me, is experiencing the power curve as your character grows and gets stronger through your adventures. Like other RPGs and even previous Elder Scrolls games, Skyrim features a leveling system that starts you as an inexperienced novice at level 1 and then has you improving various skills through usage, or by paying skill trainers, and eventually becoming a master in various fields, capable of accomplishing greater feats within the world and handling yourself better against more difficult challenges the more you level up. That's the goal, anyway, but progression doesn't satisfy me in Skyrim because there's too much reliance on level scaling and just generally not enough challenge. The idea with level scaling is that the game will custom tailor areas of the world to match your level as a character, so that you're always experiencing an appropriate level of challenge and reward. If you're level 10, then the world will be populated with enemies that are around level 10 as well, and the type of loot you can acquire will be appropriate for a level 10 character. Unlike Oblivion, which foolishly applied seemingly unlimited level scaling parameters to all enemies in all areas, which eventually led to common enemies roaming around basic areas with ultra-rare, high-end enchanted equipment, Skyrim sensibly limits enemies in areas to certain ranges. Thus, some enemies will start the game much higher level than you and will be therefore difficult, if not impossible, to fight. However, if you level up sufficiently, they start matching your level and increase in strength with you, up until a point when they stop leveling and become easier targets the more you continue to outlevel them. That's a fine enough system and certainly a better compromise over what they did with Oblivion, as I understand a world this big probably needs some sort of level scaling like that to keep everything balanced. I don't think they struck a good balance, however, considering I was able to completely break the difficulty curve by level 8 on normal difficulty when I suddenly found myself capable of defeating giants, who are level 32 enemies, with just a few basic buffs. Giants are supposed to be some of the toughest enemies for a starting player, and so once I hit that threshold merely a few hours into the game, I realized that progression was all downhill from there, as I didn't have any tougher enemies to build up towards. What's even worse is that dragons, which are supposed to be the main antagonist threat and really should be treated like final bosses that you have to progressively work your way up towards fighting, are forcibly scaled to your level at all times, meaning a dragon is actually easier for a level 1 character to kill than, say, a giant or a mammoth. Consequently, there's no feeling of genuine threat in the world, and character growth doesn't feel as impactful, especially when you start the game fighting Bandits, Draugr, and Falmer, and end the game 50 levels and 100 hours later fighting those exact same enemies, who are just higher level using better gear now. Besides improving your character through level ups, you also improve by gaining stronger equipment, and the equipment progression likewise suffers from the scaling effect. All equipment is divided into different tiers based on the material they're made of, and stronger materials will only appear in the world, either being used by enemies or found in chests, once you reach certain level ranges. That's kind of boring, really, because that means better equipment is more of a reward for how long you've been playing the game, rather than any specific challenge or feat you've accomplished. You don't find better gear by pushing yourself into higher level territory and defeating more difficult enemies, because the level scaled enemies usually means you won't find things that are significantly stronger than you anyway, but also because the level scaled loot means you'll always be finding the same varieties of the same things everywhere you go. Once you cross a new threshold and acquire a full set of new weapons and armor, there's nothing to look forward to progression wise for another 10 level ups or so, because you already have the best stuff you can get at that point, and all you can do is buy your time waiting for the next tier to unlock itself. Thus, you know when setting out to explore a random dungeon that whatever you find inside is going to be the same or worse than what you're already using unless you get really, really lucky and find something with a special enchantment on it. 
The net effect of level scaling enemies and level scaling loot is that progression just doesn't feel earned in this game. The game decides for you what enemies you'll be fighting, when and where, and basically just gives you better equipment at its own predetermined intervals, effectively forcing you to go through the same path of progression as every character for every playthrough. It's not a game about overcoming the difficulty curve and carving your own path through the world, but simply following the intended path that the game's algorithms have already laid out for you. As such, leveling up and getting stronger doesn't feel very satisfying to me, because it feels like I'm just going through the motions with a near constant status quo. You obviously get significantly stronger as the game progresses, but everything else gets stronger too, to a certain degree, which effectively offsets some of your own progress and makes individual level ups feel less impactful. There's some merit to be had with maintaining a more consistent challenge level throughout the full game experience, but when the power gap feels roughly the same for the majority of the game, that ends up feeling pretty stagnant and uninteresting to me. I'd much rather have a more variable difficulty curve with a wider power gap that has to be closed through my own determination and hard work. I don't know how feasible that actually is with this world design, but the end result of Bethesda's design is that I just don't find much fun or satisfaction in leveling up. Then you've got the fact that some skills are just flat out tedious and uninteresting to level. Smithing and enchanting are both incredibly powerful and incredibly important for virtually every playstyle who's seeking to max out their character statistics, but leveling these skills is a shallow, repetitive grindfest of just doing the same things over and over and over again. Unlike other skills that you use all the time and which are constantly leveling up as a byproduct of merely playing the game, you don't generally use these skills unless you're specifically looking to grind experience or farm income. If you were to only use these skills to craft gear you'd actually intend to use for yourself, they would barely level up at all. So your only choice is to repetitively grind the skill like you're playing 2001 era runescape or pay skill trainers a small fortune to effectively skip the normal leveling process. Other skills seem to have conflicting leveling systems, as blocking attacks will level your block skill but prevent your armor skill from leveling. As a two-handed melee character, I found the block skill never really factored into my playstyle because I could safely soak up damage with my heavy armor and blocking attacks just slowed down how quickly I could kill enemies, but if I wanted to level the skill to continue leveling my character's overall level, then I basically had to periodically just stand there holding down the block key doing nothing for minutes at a time, which certainly doesn't qualify as fun or engaging gameplay. This section will be relatively short because there's not much to say other than the combat system feels horribly clunky and outdated. And I don't just mean because the game is 9 years old that the combat system feels 9 years old, as it feels even older than that, like it was outdated even in 2011 when it first launched. Melee combat in particular feels like it hasn't evolved much from what games were doing back in the early 2000s, except with even less depth in some cases. Sure, the animations are smoother and it plays more fluidly than games of that era, but the general tactics and execution remain pretty much the same. You perform the same type of attacks no matter how your character is moving or positioned unless you hold the attack button down to perform a power attack, and enemies don't move around very intelligently, leading to most fights being a simple back and forth where you just spam the attack button while moving in and out of the opponent's attack range. Enemies make no reaction to taking damage unless it's by a critical hit or power attack, so combat feels somewhat unresponsive in that regard, like you're just whacking a bag of potatoes with a stick. You don't really have to worry about running out of stamina because you can continue attacking indefinitely, even with no stamina, and you can just wail on enemies with little concern for timing or positioning, especially given the fact that you can pause the game and heal up to full health in an instant using potions. As long as you have enough healing potions at your disposal and can survive the first hit, you're effectively invincible in this game, and that reduces a lot of the tension and excitement from ordinary combat when you always have a get out of jail free card up your sleeve at all times. Consider that, in the years before Skyrim, we got games like Dark Messiah of Might and Magic, Mountain Blade, Risen, Demon Souls and Dark Souls, and six months later, Dragon's Dogma, all of which have way more sophisticated and mechanically engaging melee systems than Skyrim, and it should be pretty apparent how outdated Skyrim's combat system is, even for 2011 standards. Magic is somehow even more primitive and uninteresting, at least when it comes to the School of Destruction magic. Destruction is the game's primary option for raw damage dealing, but most spells in the school are just your basic, straightforward point-and-click gameplay where you just spam your desired spell over and over again until you run out of mana. 
The novice level spells, in particular, are just holding down left click while hovering the reticle over your target, most of whom just come charging straight at you, and then passively waiting for them to die. That's not very fun gameplay, and thus never enticed me in either playthrough to dabble in offensive magic. Maybe another school like Conjuration would be more interesting, but it seems like a lot of those spells rely on summoning allies and letting them passively tank hits and deal damage, or summoning spellbound melee weapons, at which point you're back to the clunky melee system. I don't know, the magic spells in this game just never really caught my interest, and so I never really messed with it much in either playthrough, outside of basic buffs and utility spells. I therefore can't say I'm much of an expert on the magic system, but first impressions certainly were not very appealing to me. The dragon shouts are a nice addition, at least. Per Skyrim's lore, every time you defeat a dragon in the wild, you harvest its soul, which you can spend learning different dragon shouts based on ancient word walls that teach you the dragon language. These shouts act as quasi-magic-like abilities, like the iconic Fus Roda that sends out a force blast knocking enemies over, or a whirlwind sprint that quickly boosts you forward. Others do basic buffs and debuffs, and even more bizarre things like slowing time or turning yourself into an ethereal form that can neither harm nor be harmed by enemies. These are fun because they work on their own recharge rate, and thus synergize well with any playstyle. There's no reason not to use them, as you're not sacrificing proficiency in another field to be able to use them, and some of the abilities can have an interesting effect on the gameplay. Up until this point, this review has been pretty critical, but I can at least tolerate some of the problems in the preceding sections. Here, however, I simply cannot cut Bethesda any slack, because these types of issues are just completely inexcusable. I understand that it's almost impossible for a game of this size to be perfectly polished and completely bug-free, but it's simply astounding how many bugs and glitches have persisted in this game considering how much Bethesda have been milking this game with extra paid content, special editions, and re-releases. They've clearly continued supporting and working on this game, and have been trying to get people to spend more and more money on it, and yet apparently they couldn't be bothered to fix a bunch of problems that have been in the game since it first came out. Simply put, it's shameful not to put in that effort when you're profiting as much as you are and are still coming up with new ways to get people to buy Skyrim again, and even more so to rely on your fan base to fix the game for you with free labor. To be clear, there's an extensive, unofficial patch created by fans that supposedly addresses a lot of the game's rougher edges, but this mod requires that you have all of the DLC or one of the re-released compilation versions, and I wasn't willing to pay Bethesda more money just to get someone else to fix their game. As such, I was left with only Bethesda's official patches to fix up the game, which were sorely lacking compared to what the fans have put together unofficially. At this point, a lot of the issues are relatively minor physics glitches, like NPCs spazzing out or getting stuck in walls, but I still ran into a lot of really bizarre issues, like during the Siege of Whiterun where objects were flying all over the sky or my character would randomly go into the swimming animation and dead NPCs would fly up in the air like they were being thrashed around by an invisible demon. The game's use of the Havoc physics engine apparently ties a lot of animations to the game's frame rate, which can make the game literally unplayable on modern computers running it at over 60 frames per second without manually editing configuration files or downloading script extenders. I mean seriously, I literally could not get through the opening cart ride without modifying the game to make it work properly. I replaced the dead Gildergreen with the young sapling, and instead of replacing the old model, the game just pasted the sapling inside of the dead tree. Not a big deal as it's simply a visual thing, but a common problem nonetheless that seems like it should have an easy fix and which Bethesda was just too lazy to address. Sometimes the mouse controls just completely lock up in interface screens, forcing you to use the keyboard. I got really sick of how my character would get constantly stuck indefinitely running forward every time after I performed a sprinting power attack, even with my hands completely off the movement keys. That's another bug that's apparently been there since launch, and the only way to avoid it is to just stop all control inputs for a moment after a sprinting two-handed power attack, which is a clunky and awkward workaround that you really shouldn't have to mess with when that's been a known issue since 2011. More critically, I also had a few major quest lines just completely break down because NPCs decided not to advance to the next stage of the quest, or because they became permanently hostile. Well... Alright, just because we're friends. Give me, say, 750 gold, and we can. Hey, where do you think you're going? Come back here. Uh. 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 
I also need to take a moment to point out how absolutely terrible the default user interface is, because it's mind-boggling that this is what Bethesda deemed good enough for the final product. The whole thing consists of floating lists of plain white text with minimal ways to sort or organize information, all put together in a way that greatly limits the amount of on-screen information at a time, forcing you to scroll through long lists to find something or bring up each individual item if you just want to do a quick glance of its stats for the sake of comparison. The inventory system, for instance, is fine if you only ever have a handful of items, but becomes a nightmare to parse once you start accumulating a lot of stuff, which is pretty much inevitable the longer the game goes on. The favorites window seems like a quick and convenient way to swap equipment or use items, but that, too, eventually becomes a long, cluttered list that you have to hunt and scroll through every time you bring it up. And that's not even to mention its awkward game-pausing effect that disrupts the natural flow of gameplay every time you have to use it. Again, I could tolerate this kind of thing if Skyrim were just a one-time deal, but Bethesda have been incessantly pushing it back into the market. It's still making the news in late 2020 with it being added to Microsoft's Xbox Game Pass portfolio. And some people seem to give the bugs and glitches a comical pass like they're design features instead of actual mechanical flaws in the game design. I realize this might be an unfair comparison, but just look at what CD Projekt have done with their Witcher games. They've continually released major updates and complete enhanced edition overhauls of those games years after release and made them available completely free to anyone who's ever purchased the base games. I mean, they completely revamped the interface in The Witcher 3 after a year of hearing criticism from fans about how it could be improved and patched it into the base game, even for people who weren't spending the extra money on the latest expansion. Contrast that with Bethesda, who relies on their fans to fix their own problems and then ask that you pay more money purchasing the same game again to get certain new features and updates that weren't or couldn't be patched into the base game. Despite all of my criticism, there are some things Skyrim does that I actually enjoy and consider to be well executed even compared to other similar types of games that I enjoy more. For example, I really, really like how you pick up quests in Skyrim. In a lot of other RPGs, you pick up quests by just indiscriminately talking to everyone you see, purely in an effort on your end to seek out content. There's no logical or immersive reason you would want to walk up to someone standing on the side of the road, strike up a conversation with them, and then volunteer your time and energy to help them out, and so it all feels awkwardly forced and artificial. That's not really the case in Skyrim. Instead, you pick up quests in far more natural and immersive ways as part of basic exploration, rather than extrinsically seeking out content. Instead of seeing someone with an exclamation point over their head, or someone standing around in a suspiciously obvious location like they have something they want you to do, you pick up quests by overhearing conversations and deciding for yourself if it's something you might want to get involved with, or an NPC will approach you asking for your assistance. Sometimes couriers show up to deliver a letter from someone you've met previously, or from someone who's heard of your exploits and wants to employ your services. You might read a book and uncover some interesting information leading to a new quest. Sometimes you wander into active events and simply find yourself involved in whatever situation is unfolding. Or, if you're deliberately seeking out information about where to find quests, you simply approach a bartender and ask them what the local rumors are, and they point you towards relevant people. That's all really well executed, and it makes the world feel that much more immersive when you pick up quests like that, instead of the usual methods that so many other games, even some of my favorites, employ. I also appreciate how much backstory is injected into seemingly ordinary and pointless NPCs. It seems like almost every character has some kind of role to serve in the world, even if it's not something that directly relates to the player through mechanical interaction, as service providers or just providing for themselves. Even someone like Nazim, who doesn't really do anything except walk around town, essentially as a filler character there to occupy space, has a personality and relationship to someone else in the world, as he has a wife who runs their farm outside of town. And you can talk to a lot of these people about where they come from and why they're in whatever situation they're in, what they're hoping to accomplish in the future, and so on. I might not care about some random merchant's backstory personally, but it's cool that you can talk to them about it, as that helps to flesh out the game's lore and makes everything feel a little bit more richly detailed. I like the way guards and NPCs react to all of the various events that unfold as a result of your adventures. After you restore the Gilder Green Tree in Whiterun, people will notice it and thank you for it. 
If you join the Companions, people will start talking to you like you're one of them, telling you to keep your dog quiet at night and wondering if that's fur they see growing around your ears. None of these are of any real impact or consequence, but it's a nice touch that makes the world feel a little more dynamic and reactive to your presence. It's a realistic and immersive, after all, that guards and ordinary NPCs would notice and comment on some of the things you do. It's not always perfect, however, like when I started the initiation quest for the College of Winterhold, then immediately fast-traveled to another location and had a guard comment on me being that one from the college and that he'd heard of me. That was a case when he really shouldn't have known that, given that it literally just happened and I had little to no reputation within the college at that point, but I like the sentiment behind those little responses. I like walking around Sovngarde and getting to meet dead NPCs you've heard stories about previously, or getting to follow up with other characters you met in life now that they're dead. It's a minor thing, but it's a neat visual to be wandering through the mist with that chanting chorus playing behind you, and then seeing the ghostly apparitions of fallen characters begin to materialize before you, whom you can then actually talk to. I just wish there could have been even more named NPCs with more dialogue to be had during this segment of the game, because it seems like such a rich opportunity for extensive lore and world building through fun, interactive gameplay, and there's really only a small handful of characters with whom you can have significant interactions. Still a cool concept, though. In fact, the general look and overall atmosphere of the game is pretty solid, too. I like how much variety they've put into the environments, while still retaining that Nordic Viking aesthetic. From the grassy hills around Whiterun, to the volcanic hot springs of Riften, to the icy tundra of Windhelm, to the rocky cliffs of Markarth, to the dense evergreen forests of Falkreath, it all looks really good and makes exploration a little more interesting just because it feels like you're always getting to experience so many new and different environments. Despite the somewhat dated graphics, but with it being nearly 10 years old at this point, there's still artistic merit in the environmental design that makes it all really pretty to look at. It would not interest me personally, but I'm sure someone could get a lot of satisfaction just treating Skyrim like a glorified nature trek hiking simulator, just walking around taking in the scenery and ignoring pretty much everything else the game has to offer. I know this is in the things I like section, but while on the subject of the visuals I do want to take a moment to say that I wish the game had some better animations for its NPCs, who tend to just stand around in their idle stances during conversation. That's kind of boring, and doesn't look much better than what we had with Morrowind almost 10 years earlier. I mean, just take a look at your first actual meeting with Ulfric Stormcloak, who, need I remind you, is one of, if not the most important characters in all of Skyrim. Only the foolish or the courageous approach a Jarl without summons. Do I know you? Ah, yes. Destined for the chopping block, if I'm not mistaken. A fair point. Well, you've come to the right place then. Speak with Galmar. I'm always looking for able fighters. Not everyone can say they made it out of Helga. I'm the finger down your spine when all the lights are out, and the name on all the men's room walls. When I pout, the whole world tries to make me smile, and everyone always wants to know who is that girl. I like that moment when the merchant in Riverwood sends his sister to guide you to the nearby Bleak Falls Barrow as part of a main quest, wherein she walks you through town making idle conversation about the thieves and the golden claw they stole, and then points out where to find Bleak Falls Barrow using actual landmarks and navigational directions for reference. This is such a simple moment and really shouldn't be noteworthy on its own, but it's a rare instance where the game takes the time to give you quest directions through contextual, in-world means instead of just putting a nondescript icon on your compass. It works because the quest has a fixed location, as opposed to being randomized, and the world design in this area feels relatively compact and densely structured, with the different paths and landmarks each having some kind of notable spatial relationship to something else, as opposed to just being a wide open field with your destination some huge and arbitrary distance away. It's one of very few instances where the quest design integrates with the world design effectively, and having Camillo there chatting with you gives it a little extra touch of humanity. Again, this isn't something I would praise in most other games, but it's notable in Skyrim because of how much it contrasts with the rest of the overall design. It shows that Bethesda can design things like this, but just chooses not to in most cases. I'm not a big fan of Jeremy Soule as a musical composer, generally speaking, but I have to admit that the soundtrack actually does a pretty good job at establishing unique and interesting moods and atmospheres without being too intrusive. 
I have a hard time calling specific songs to mind because a lot of it feels so airy and nebulous without much of a melodic hook to latch onto, but I was surprised by how many tracks I recognized and could associate with specific areas when listening to the soundtrack in the background while writing this review. Hearing the streets of Whiterun while wandering around town and seeing the snowy mountains off in the distance can be a genuinely tranquil experience. Likewise, while looking up at the night sky illuminated by the Aurora Borealis while Secunda plays, which is a beautifully serene track in its own right, but also somehow gives off a feeling of wistful optimism. Like you're about to set off on an adventure and you're kind of nervous about it, but still filled with forlorn hope over the thrills and excitement that lie in wait for you in the next morning. And that's pretty impressive, whenever a soundtrack can get me thinking about deeper emotions like that. Finally, I find that some of the quests are genuinely interesting and entertaining. Mostly, these pertain to some of the more outlandish scenarios, many of them being Daedric quests. Like when you accept a seemingly benign challenge to a drinking contest and then have to spend the next day traveling the world and figuring out what kind of weird shenanigans you got into the night before and setting everything right. It's fun and exciting when you go to loot a seemingly ordinary rucksack and suddenly hear a spectral voice talking to you, which then sets you on a quest to restore the light to a goddess's shrine, or when a homeless man sets you on a quest looking for his master, which then whisks you away to an alternate dimension where you have to solve puzzles for a Daedric prince. That quest in particular is a lot of fun because it has some of the most creative puzzles in the game and is entirely about messing around with the Waba Jack trying to figure out its intended uses for those puzzles, and thus makes for a nice change of pace from the usual dungeon crawling quests. And really, this is the thing that makes me want to continue playing in spite of a lot of general mediocrity that I find in the rest of the gameplay because there's always this random chance that you'll stumble into one of these weird, crazy quests that completely break and defy expectations. While Skyrim might serve as a decent sandbox in allowing you a lot of open-ended freedom to do whatever and pretend whatever you want, making whatever type of experience you want out of it based on whatever creativity you put into your playthrough, I find it seriously lacking in some areas that I find really important for these types of open-world RPGs. As an RPG, I find it lacking in meaningful ways to effect your role-playing decisions into the actual gameplay, since most quests have straightforward solutions without choices or consequences, and you have such limited options for how you interact with NPCs. Although you might imagine your character to be a certain way, the game doesn't really acknowledge this, except when it comes to combat and dungeon crawling. The progression system feels pretty unsatisfying to me because the perks don't really change gameplay that much, seeing as most of them are just passive statistical modifiers, while the level scaled enemies and level scaled loot makes the feeling of leveling up and getting stronger feel largely static because the rest of the world is leveling up with you. It's not nearly as extreme as it was in Oblivion, but there's still too much of it for my taste. As an open world game, I find the world itself to be largely uninteresting, as the bulk of the landmass only exists to spread the various marked locations out, while there's too much reliance on repetitive dungeon crawling to fill the world with content. It's a classic case of quantity over quality, like Bethesda were so preoccupied with making everything bigger and more expansive that they didn't bother to flesh any of it out. The Radiant Quests are possibly the biggest example of this flawed mindset. In Bethesda's effort to populate this massive world with quests and things to do, they resorted to a computer algorithm that generates quests by combining generic objectives with random locations, thereby giving you a metric crap ton of side quests to complete, but with none of them having any sort of interesting story, character, or unique mechanical gameplay scenarios. Now of course, it's to be expected that, with a world this big, not every quest will be a home run and will inevitably wind up with a fair portion of them being simple, mundane fetch quests and whatnot. But that's an inherent consequence of having a world this big. You either have a huge world with a lot of tedious and repetitive filler, or a smaller world with more finely crafted and unique experiences. And personally speaking, I would take the smaller, denser world just about every time if it meant having higher quality content inside it. Believe it or not, I don't think Skyrim is necessarily a bad game, as there's still plenty of interesting content and things to do to justify a playthrough, but the whole thing just screams missed potential to me, while a lot of the things I value most in these types of games tend to be pretty mediocre here. If you're going to play Skyrim at all, it seems like you basically need to install mods that radically alter the way the core game actually functions in order to make a decent game out of it 
which to be fair seems doable with the mods that are out there, but again I'm not fond of paying Bethesda to have other people fix up their game for them, as that's essentially rewarding Bethesda for lazy, half-hearted efforts. I'll just refer back to the shoddy user interface. After re-releasing the game however many times, they've still done practically nothing to fix it up. I can only presume their line of reasoning to be that, well, someone made a popular mod to fix that, which means we don't have to do it ourselves now. Which, if that's the approach they're taking retroactively, then what's to stop them from thinking like that proactively while they're still developing the game? Ultimately, the end result is a game that can be decently fun at times, but which spends more time than not disappointing me with shallow and repetitive gameplay that just doesn't capture my interest like other, similar types of games in this field have. I don't begrudge anyone who enjoys it, but it's not a satisfying RPG to me, and I've enjoyed lots of other open world games better. The unfortunate reality is that, despite the game's epic landscape and grandiose heights, there's not much actual depth to the experience, and that's what I find most disappointing.